Hello and welcome to those joining us on Zoom and live on Facebook for Dialogue Firesides, March 21st, 2021. I'm Taylor Petrie, conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Board members Michael Austin and Chris Kimball are also part of our group today. More than 50 years of Dialogue content, articles, essays, poetry, and art is available online at dialoguejournal.com. These Dialogue Fireside sessions are posted on the Dialogue Journal YouTube channel and on our podcast feed in your favorite podcast app and at dialoguejournal.com slash podcasts. We're so grateful for our dedicated audience. If you're enjoying these events, please consider supporting Dialogue by subscription or donation at dialoguejournal.com slash subscribe. Tonight, we're pleased to hear from Terrell Givens. His remarks today are titled, Contested Orthodoxies and Alternate Futures, a Revisionist Account of Christian History. Well known to many of us as perhaps the foremost living LDS scholar, Terrell Givens is a New York native and did his graduate work in LDS history, I'm sorry, in intellectual history at Cornell and comparative literature at UNC Chapel Hill. In 2019, he retired from the job as a Bostwick chair at the University of Richmond to be the Neil A. Maxwell Senior Research Fellow in Provo. He's been a commentator on CNN, NPR, and in the PBS frontline documentary, The Mormons. Gibbons' work has been called provocative reading by the New York Times and includes a two volume history of Mormon thought, Wrestling the Angel and Feeding the Flock, studies of the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price, and several books with his wife, Fiona, most recently, All Things New, Rethinking Sin, Salvation, and Everything in Between. UNC will release his new biography, Stretching the Heavens, Eugene England and the Crisis of Modern Mormonism in July, 2021. And a note that this is the Dialogue Book Club pick for our summer reading. If you're interested in joining the book club to get a copy of the book and exclusive member benefits, check out dialoguejournal.com slash book club. After Terrell's marks, we will uh, open up for Q&A. We're running a webinar format, so we can't do live questions from the audience. However, you may submit comments on the chat, and I and others will help to moderate those comments and questions. Our opening musical number is O Magnum Mysterium by Morton Lorisden, the Concordia Choir, and Renee Clausen. After our musical number, we'll have an invocation offered by Calvin Burke, who is an English major at Brigham Young University, and a media manager for Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. We'll then immediately move to our main presentation. Our Father in heaven, we love thee. We are so grateful for this opportunity, this Sabbath day that we have to come together as, as friends, as scholars, as Latter-day Saints throughout the Mormon diaspora. We pray, Father, that we might draw near to thee and to each other we are so grateful for Dr. Givens and for his work. We ask the Heavenly Father that thy spirit might attend us this evening, that we might be able to, to learn of thee, to learn more of ourselves and of each other. We ask as well this time, a special blessing upon all of us, upon our, our weeping world, that all of us who feel so besieged by sorrow, that we might be able to find comfort in thy spirit, but also with each other. We pray, Father, that our hearts might be opened and in tune to those who are suffering and those who especially find themselves without places to turn for a surcease of pain. Please bless us that we might be able to be thy hands here on this earth and to lift their burdens. We pray, Heavenly Father, once again, for just a moment of gratitude this evening that we all have this opportunity to come together. And for these things, we humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for that beautiful invocation, Calvin. Um, it's a lovely reminder to know that I'm facing friends and uh, fellow Latter-day Saints. And thank you, Michael, for preparing that music according to my request. I did that so that whatever happens from this point on, the night will not have been a waste, because you heard one of the most beautiful pieces of religious music ever written. 
So this evening, uh, I hope you will indulge me because I don't have a finished product to share. What I have is a work in progress. And so I am in the beginning stages of a project that I imagine will occupy me for some years to come. And I call it Provisionally Contested Orthodoxies and Alternate Futures, a Revisionist Account of Christian History. So I'd like to try to explain at the beginning what this project is and what it isn't. It isn't an attempt to rewrite Christian history in terms of a normative or authoritative master narrative. It's an attempt rather to recapture uh, what I consider to be some of the, well, contested orthodoxies and alternate futures. And I'll explain that in just a moment as we get further along. But I will say that another way of conceiving of my project uh, borrows from Tom Holland's phrase, which he uses in his book, Dominion, uh, what happens when love is cut loose from its theological moorings. So a guiding thesis uh, and sensibility maybe behind this master project is the belief that one way we might think about the derailing of Christianity in the early centuries is as a cutting loose of love from a rigorous theological uh, set of moorings. And I hope that will become at least subtly evident in what follows. So let me start by trying to make an argument for the timeliness and relevance of what I'm trying to do here. Uh, recently, I was reading one of N.T. Wright's books. This one was uh, The Day the Revolution Began. And I was struck by how prevalent this motif was in his book, this insistence that Christianity had, in fact, been severed from its foundations. So he says he started his thinking about Jesus' death with the assumption from what I had been taught that the death of Jesus was all about God saving me from my sin so I could go to heaven. That, of course, can be quite a revolutionary idea if someone who's never thought about it, but it's not quite the revolution the early Christians were talking about. Some of our great controversies may have more to do with fresh interpretive schemes introduced at a later date than with the original meaning of the Bible. Uh, how we are saved is closely linked to the question of what we are saved for, and we must restore the biblical vision of God's ultimate future and reconceive atonement in relation to that. So I just give these as a sampling of a theme that we're hearing from perhaps, well, he's certainly one of the most popular religious writers on the scene today. He doesn't use the word apostasy. That's certainly the word that uh, Latter-day Saints have historically used to describe the phenomenon that he's describing, but I, I find it really striking how baldly he announces, uh, essentially, that modern Christianity has very little to do with uh, early Christian texts and voices. Now, he's saying this from a devotional kind of hortatory uh, position. In the, the world of Christian studies, early Christian studies, we find a growing consensus that's incomplete agreement with what he is saying. And this is just a sampling. I could have provided two or three times this number of scholars telling the same story. In the early fifth century, a new orthodoxy sprung out of Augustine's head. Pelagius was, in fact, a traditionalist defending the true faith against the innovations of Augustine. Of course, Henry Chadwick said that quite some time ago, but he was a minority voice at that time. Ali Bonner has recently written, Pelagius did not invent anything. Augustine and his allies installed as orthodoxy a much more novel Augustinian gospel. And then as Gross says, many people spell something very new in Augustine's interpretation of St. Paul, but his continuous tracts against the Pelagians carry the day and convince the church that this was what it had always taught. Now, what, what I find striking about this moment in, uh, in Christian historiography is on the one hand, both pastorally and academically, we find a growing consensus that Christianity is invented in the early fifth century. And yet, none of the standard histories of Christianity, whether you're talking about, you know, 
uh, Pelican or Gonzalez or or uh, Roger Olson or you know any others we could name Johnson, they all write as if orthodoxy is a given from the very beginning of the story. So it seems to me that what we have in in essence is a radical discontinuity between what the scholars are saying at the micro level and the macro story that continues to be told. Uh, this is true in early Christian studies, but I'm hearing the same complaint in Reformation studies. This is from Durbin Bacullock. Radical thinkers and preachers in the early stages of the Reformation represented possible future identities for Latin Christianity. And that's my focus tonight, Latin Christianity. Yet they have been marginalized and rejected by Catholics and Protestants alike because they radically questioned the grim certainties which both sides shared and suggested new, more constructive approaches to divine power and its interplay with humanity. And now his main point. Very often, mainstream Christianity is only now re-examining these alternative views of the future, hence my title, Alternative Futures, and recognizing how much value there is in them. And then this striking uh, observation. A modern Anglican or even a modern Roman Catholic is likely to be more like a 16th century Anabaptist in belief than he or she resembles a 16th century member of the Church of England. Uh, and yet, as I said, I, I can't encounter any uh, Christian narratives that reflect these growing recognitions by early Christian and Reformation scholars alike. So it seems to me that here's, here's the problem that we face. On the one hand, even people, uh, David Brackey recently spoke at the Maxwell Institute, for example, and he is fully aware of how diverse early Christianities were. Uh, he questions you know, the, the notion of an orthodoxy that goes back to the, the early centuries, and yet he continues to use the word proto-orthodoxy. So to the extent that we keep using a word like proto-orthodoxy, and so does Bart Ehrman, we, it seems to me, perpetuate the fallacy that there is a, some kind of a continuity from the early Christian centuries to the present, where in actual fact, if we are recognizing that Irenaeus, Origen, and Pelagius represented a very, very divergent set of beliefs and doctrines, then somehow our, our Christian narratives should be cognizant of this disjunction, uh, and yet I don't see it. So, so the question that I'm I'm posing and and trying to respond to is, well, what would such a, a history look like? And it seems to me that a Latter Day Saint uh, sensibility is particularly uh, pertinent in this case because all of these views are fully consistent uh, in their major outlines with the essential outlines of what Latter-day Saints have called, you know, the, the, the Christian apostasy for a, a very long time. So in simple terms, as I see it, this is how conventional narratives op operate. There's just this kind of given of an orthodoxy, and that's the story we're going to tell. And if pre-existence drops out, then it just drops out. And the idea of moral freedom drops out in, in, in the early fifth century, that drops out. And the passability of God and educative ascent, limited sovereignty, early resurrection, they just, they become footnotes in these general histories. And so the question I'm asking consistent with the, the sensibility that Dermot McCullough uh, articulated is what would happen if instead we, we were to think of Christian historiography in this way? So that while we have this, this, well, you know, we, is what becomes a dominant strain of orthodoxy. We look at what happened to these contested orthodoxies that dropped by the wayside. And instead of just relegating them to the status of footnotes, what if we actually pursued those histories until they return front and center to Christian consciousness, um, sometimes in the Middle Ages, sometimes in the Reformation, and sometimes in at the dawn of the 21st century, as we see with somebody like N.T. Wright. So, as I said at the beginning, this wouldn't constitute a new master narrative. It would constitute rather a kind of series of micro narratives that are more faithful to the earliest uh, sensibilities and teachings 
uh, of the first three or four Christian centuries and, and connect those to the religious sensibility that is becoming foregrounded in our own, in our, in our own day today. So um, let me give you an example of how this would, would work in certain instances. And, and to just return briefly to the alternate title that I mentioned at the very beginning about the um, severing of love from its theological roots, it seems to me that, that the whole galaxy of core ideas that fall by the wayside at the time of the Augustinian revolution, they all constitute, um, they, they, they are a kind of constellation of theological presuppositions about the nature of love. If you think about um, genuine passability and vicarious salvation and universalism and non-retributive justice and a theosis that is seen as non-threatening, um, all of these together constitute, it seems to me, a, very, a fairly coherent and self-consistent uh, narrative of God's love. And it seems to me quite obvious that by the time we get to the modern era, love is an empty signifier that we can fill in any way that satisfies our political or emotional imperatives. And, and what I would like to argue is that, no, we can actually reconstitute a theology of love that is uh, utterly annihilated in, in the years that uh, Augustine comes to dominance. So uh, the first case study th that I would begin with would be um, pre-existence. So part of what I would envision taking place in this kind of a, of a history of Christianity would be a focus on <clears throat> the controversies that resulted in the success of one orthodoxy over another, rather than just mentioning incidentally, oh, at this moment, pre-existence fades from Christian consciousness. Re-examine the how and the why and the when that those minor revolutions took place. So for example, in the first couple of Christian centuries, pre-existence isn't the universal belief of Christians, but it's common. Um, there seem to be two uh, traditions that feed into early Christianity in this regard. Uh, one is Jewish and one is Platonic. But Justin Martyr, for example, says uh, human souls are begotten wholly apart and not along with their respective bodies. So obviously he's contesting a, a, a view that is prevalent in the second century. Um, excuse me, he is in fact affirming, right, an, an eternal identity to the human soul. As Clement of Alexandria seems to be doing, his his statements are rather vague, but a general consensus that he too was a proponent of the uh, eternal preexistence of the human soul. We, the rational creatures of the word of God on whose account we date from the beginning, for in the beginning was the word. On the other side of, of the controversy, you have Irenaeus, uh, who isn't, isn't usually wide of the mark, according to LDS standards, but he was here. God alone, who is Lord of all, is without beginning and without end. The soul was not anterior to the body in its essence. Tertullian will be a powerful opponent of pre-existence and his rationale is one that we will find recurrent in Christian orthodoxy, which, which is that it's too threatening to God's unique status as an eternal being. Uh, and so he criticizes it in his treatise on the soul. I want to, to give this example from the Hymn of the Pearl for uh, reasons that will become clear in just a moment. But this, of course, is one of the, the most beautiful lyrical uh, narratives that we get, uh, an allegory of pre-existence. It's circulating in the fourth century in the Acts of Thomas. And most of you are familiar with this lovely hymn uh, about the child that is sent on a mission. He divests himself of his bright robe of glory, but a covenant is woven into his heart so that he will not forget his origin in celestial courts to which he will eventually return. So by the time we, we, we get to origin, he feels safe in establishing pre-existence as orthodoxy. Um, as a kind of side note here, and I could really get distracted here because I'm, I, I grow so increasingly frustrated and exasperated by scholars of the first rank like John Baer and, and others 
who are determined to explain away origins, views on pre-existence and insist that they're just ideational in the mind of God. There wasn't anything real about human pre-existence. And yet I just compiled just on one pass through of his first principles, a dozen statements affirming a literal, actual, tangible, right? Spiritual pre-existence. And so as the first systematic theologian in the church, his views had great influence and authority and they represented the dominant view uh, for quite a while. We get to the young Augustine around 387 and he writes to Jerome because he, he, he isn't sure, he hasn't decided yet his own position on pre-existence. And so he says there are four views about souls that he's aware of. The first is propagation by parents, traducianism. This means that when a man and woman have sexual intercourse, they produce not just a spirit, but they produce a, excuse me, not just a physical body, they produce a spirit as well. This is a view that is only held today by Lutherans, by the way. Second, they are created individually for each person who is born, creationism. Augustine found that a very problematic view because he didn't understand how if God places a new spirit into a physically created body, how can it be uh, a carrier of original sin if it comes directly from God? So he found that problematic. They already exist somewhere and are sent by God into the bodies of those who are born. This is why uh, I, I personally think that he probably was familiar with the hymn of the pearl because I can't find another single example, textual example prior to the fourth century of this version of, of sent pre-existence. And then fourth, he names fallen pre-existence. They sink into bodies by their own choice. This would be the Chaldean version, Mesopotamian version. It's also, uh, of course, origins view of, of pre-existence. And then he concludes that it'd be rash to affirm any of these. So at this point in his career, he inclines toward origins version of pre-existence, but he'll abandon that a little bit later. So Jerome responds to Augustine saying, I remember your little problem about the origin of the soul. And he acknowledges that it's still a problem and he doesn't have a solution. And he summarizes five theories of the soul. So he, he cites origins. He also sees a stoic version as uh, different than the others. The Talmudic teaching of spirits reserved in a treasury, the goof, the treasury of souls, um, lovely Talmudic um, uh, myths and, and stories about this strain in, in Jewish thought, uh, such as the one that the philtrum, that little indentation underneath your nose, is actually the mark of the angel when Gabriel has to kind of flick you uh, and to insist that your spirit enters the body of your parents. And that's, that's a reminder of that angelic mark, uh, creationism and traducianism. Uh, at this point, the controversy he heats up. So by the late fourth century, Rafi uh, Jerome senses the winds of change. He abandons his early defense of preexistence, insists that he never believed it in the first place. Rufinus attacks him vigorously as a result. So there's just this, there's this, this great story to be told about how one of the one of the, the 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 dominant controversies in the church by the late fourth early fifth century is this question of the origin of the human soul, and it isn't until the sixth century that uh, the Council of Constantinople definitively anathematizes uh, affirmation of human preexistence, and then at that point, it falls out of the orthodox narrative. So my point would be, well, what would happen if we trace the alternate futures of that uh, core uh, Christian doctrine? So we would find that from Judaism to the early Augustine, there's a, a set of consistent teachings, the rupture with the late Augustine, but we could at that point pick up the narrative with the Gnostics and then Boethius and then Hermeticism. We could talk about the 17th century Platonists and German idealists and the Concord School and the British Romantics and the Victorians all the way to, to Robert Frost and find that there is a consistent, pervasive uh, stream of ideas that continue to affirm human preexistence all the way to the present day, but always outside of the borders of orthodoxy. In fact, a semi-comprehensive account of this uh, contested orthodoxy and alternate future would start in Babylon and go all the way to John McTaggart and Nicholas Berdayev. And I, I could say a lot about most of these characters 
in here, but um, it's, it's an, an incredibly powerful and theologically compelling paradigm. It's philosophically compelling. Uh, to give one example, Immanuel Kant offers not one, but three separate defenses of the pre-existence of the human soul. We're familiar with Wordsworth's Intimations Ode, which right, we quote in all the LDS film strips, but William Blake was even more uh, explicit in his defense of pre-existence, as were Coleridge and Shelley, both in their writings and correspondence, as well as their poetry. Con for the Concord School, this was one of their principal uh, positions, uh, um, and so on and so forth. So that would be you know, one chapter that seems to me could somehow be woven into this reconstituted Christian history. Another example of a contested orthodoxy, this one much more familiar to everyone probably is, is are the debates over predestination, inherited guilt, and freedom, which center on the Pelagian controversies of the early fifth century. Elaine Pagels, I think, is entirely typical when she points out that for nearly the first 400 years of our era, Christians regarded freedom as the primary message of Genesis 1 to 3. So again, it seems to me rather appalling that we can refer to an orthodoxy that is clearly a complete inversion of fundamentals about human anthropology that were not just incidental, but central to early Christianity. Uh, the primary message, uh, uh, at least of Genesis, as Elaine Pagels says. And uh, so we have any number of powerful proponents of this, the, this, not just the existence, but the priority, the primacy and human anthropology of this sovereign freedom. Um, these statements come from Gregory of Nyssa. And then we have these statements from uh, Calestius, at their births, infants are in that state of innocence which Adam was before his transgression. Many within the Catholic Church argue against original guilt, and some others defend it in as much as it is open to discussion and not a matter of heresy. This is what he, he claims uh, at a heresy trial that he's subjected to in, in 411 AD. I love this statement because, again, it's a window into the fact that this is a live burning controversy in the early fifth century. Now, a couple of really astonishing facts about this. First of all, um, there's an enormous scholarship on Pelagius that has emerged in the last generation. And, and as far as I can see, to a person, the consensus is he's been horribly misrepresented, uh, unfairly. Um, people like Elizabeth Clark say, oh, how much richer Christianity would be if we had followed the Pelagian stream of thought rather than the Augustinian stream of thought. Uh, it's, uh, it's a simple fallacy that he denied the grace of God uh, in this explanation. He says, posse, to be able is the ability to choose good actions or evil actions. As we are not burdened by original sin, our ability is not hampered in any way. The posse is entirely a gift from God. So he thought grace and freedom were entirely reconcilable. Uh, Julian is one of the, the, the later defenders, later in the fifth century. Um, he's going to insist that Pelagius had it right, that Augustine had it wrong when it came to the question of original sin and original guilt. Augustine himself acknowledges that early in his ministry, he labored in defense of the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God conquered. This set of dates here uh, conveys something of the confused state of affairs. Calestius is condemned for denying original guilt in 411, uh, while Pelagius is exonerated at a council four years later, then Pope Zosimus is uh, persuaded to exonerate Calestius. But then by 418, Augustine summons his impressive political allies and employs his political skills to effect a complete overthrow of the consensus. Uh, some scholars intimate that he even resorted to bribery of the emperor. And so in 418, the issue is more or less definitively closed with the embrace of original sin and original guilt and the decline of or, or excision of human freedom. So what might a history look like that, that pursues that Pelagian and Julian of Aclanum line? Well, you, you, it seems to me you, you would start 
probably with Irenaeus because he so passionately interpreted what happened in the Garden of Eden as an, uh, a, a moment of educative ascent. Um, these are statements, I think it was uh, Rowan Greer who makes these comments. Irenaeus's conviction that the dispensations of God are meant to educate humanity for its destiny. Gregory of Nyssa referred to the latter of ascent to God, his understanding of human nature, even its redeemed state as a perpetual becoming. Um, we get further statements here by Irenaeus from his treatise against heresies. I, uh, I think I wanna probably move on a little bit, so I'm not gonna pause to read all of those, but we have to read this one because this, this to my mind is eerie to the ears of a Latter-day Saint. Listen, listen to what Irenaeus writes in his third book of Against Heresies. Wherefore also he drove Adam out of paradise and removed him far from the tree of life, <clears throat> not because he envied him the tree of life, as some venture to assert, but because he pitied him and did not desire that he should continue a sinner forever, nor that the sin which surrounded him should be immortal and evil and terminable and irremediable. But he said, abound to his state of sin <clears throat> by interposing death and thus causing sin to cease, putting an end to it by the dissolution of the flesh, which would take place in the earth so that man ceasing at length to live in sin and dying to it might begin to live in God. Just compare that to Alma 42, three through six. And you wonder, did, was Joseph Smith reading Irenaeus? Um, so we don't just get a few sporadic voices. Uh, Irenaeus is, is the most prominent, but there is, this, there is this vision shared by many of the early Christians that what happened in the Garden of Eden wasn't a catastrophe, that it was a stage in human spiritual evolution that was necessary. God's providence, even the punishment is remedial, functions to educate us. According to Irenaeus, we have Nemesius of Amisa and Theodore. Um, I'm not gonna share any of their quotations with you. Um, and then all the way through to Origen. Thank you who writes, you, the soul, could not have reached the palm groves unless you had experienced the harsh trials. You could not have reached the gentle springs without first having overcome sadness and difficulties. The education of the soul is an age-long spiritual adventure beginning in this life and continuing after death. And elsewhere, he says, the world was created of such a kind and such a size as to be able to contain all those souls which were appointed to be trained in this world, <clears throat> and also those powers which were prepared to attend to serve and to assist them. So you can hear in these words a kind of overlapping with a, an early Christian uh, vision of salvation as universal. Um, I, I find it really remarkable that look at these voices from the second and third centuries. Now, uh, Mathedes in his epistle to Diognetus, which is one of the very, very earliest Christian documents that we have outside of the New Testament, and he's writing this epistle to a friend, we don't know if he's historical or not, who has inquired about this new Christian religion, but has some troubling, perplexing questions. And, and listen to how common this theme is in the earliest Christian generations. Why and fine has this new kind or practice of piety only now entered the world? Celsus, one of the, the first major critics of Christianity, the Christian doctrine of redemption centers on the mistaken idea that God abandons his creation for long periods of time and then after a period of neglect decides to return to it in a better state. Porphyry, a later critic of, the, of Christians, if as Jesus says he confronted sin for the sake of those who are weak, what of our forefathers, our ancestors, were they not likewise diseased and weakened by sin? And the Christians themselves, as in the suit of Clement, are asking the same question. Shall then those be wholly deprived of the kingdom who have died before his coming? So notice the question that is at the heart of all of these writings is how limited is salvation in the Christian scheme of things? <clears throat> and Rowan Greer writes, there is an implicit universalism in the viewpoint of most of the fathers of the church. Um, you don't hear that very much in, in the histories of Christianity that I'm reading. Uh, and yet until Augustine, that's the dominant view let me just share my favorite expression of universalism, and it comes from Macrina, who is the sister of Gregory of Nyssa. All the further barriers by which our sin has fenced us off from the things within the veil are in the end to be taken down. Whenever the time comes that the tabernacle of our nature is as it were to be fixed up again in the resurrection. 
and all the inveterate corruption of sin has vanished from the world and a universal feast will be kept around the deity by those who have decorated themselves in the resurrection and one and the same banquet will be spread for all with no differences cutting off any rational creature from an equal participation in it. <clears throat> for those who are now excluded by reason of their sin will at last be admitted within the holiest places of God's blessedness. So these aren't just sporadic outliers. These are mainstream Christian views. Origins is only the most famous because it becomes anathematized. Um, a few centuries later, it's his doctrine of apocatastasis, that the end is like the beginning. We're all in the presence of God in the beginning. We'll all be restored to that state of, uh, of blessedness. Uh, this question inevitably leads, as it did in, in, in uh, some of those statements I just quoted, to the question of, well, what about those who died without a knowledge? That question and uh, hints of answers are given in all of these sources, from the Shepherd of Hermas to Tertullian. Um, this is uh, what seems to be a clear uh, evocation of baptism for the dead. Uh, which appears in the Shepherd of Hermas, which is an absolutely core document, uh, virtually canonical to the first generations of Christians. Um, don't probably have time to read through it, so if you can scan it quickly, you'll just see that he has a reference to the dead going down into the water and coming out of it living. There are uh, references also in the Gospel of Nicodemus. There are cryptic references in the Apocalypse of Peter, the vision of Paul. So what we're seeing, in other words, is this picture of a widespread preoccupation with the question of, of can everybody be saved? And a number of voices that are suggesting yes. And even the ordinances of salvation will be universally extended through some kind of vicarious performances. <clears throat> so you can see that it would be very easy to trace the alternate future of universalism because it rises to such prominence in the Christian church again and again through time, you know, most prominently with the 18th century universalists and then William Ellery Channing. And then we get it, you know, in just the last couple of years with people as diverse as Rob Bell on the one hand and David Bentley Hart on the other. But I, I doubt that, that, the wider Christian public is aware that this is an idea with deep, deep roots in the first four Christian centuries until, guess where it ends? Well, no surprise here, when Augustine definitively states, these are they who will not be saved. Those who have never heard the gospel, those who are too young to believe and who died without baptism, all these are exactly the same as the great mass of those who are condemned. And so, again, to just connect one more time to, to my alternate title, you can see that, that something seriously devastating has happened with regard to the way in which a conception of God's love is being conceptualized and deformed um, under the influence largely of Augustine. So these are other chapters that uh, it seems to me would have an important place in this kind of a, of a history. Divine passability, sovereignty versus fatherhood. Once again, uh, for early Christians, there is this feeling of community, uh, that, that the church is a family, that there is a genuinely paternal relationship that God has to his children, and that's gonna be replaced by absolute and personal abstract sovereignty under Augustine and ditto with corporeality, the feminine divine. I'm not sure that there's enough evidence in the early Christian tradition to warrant a chapter there. There's certainly an extensive uh, Hebraic past to that idea. Theosis, sexuality and marriage, those also it seems to me would, would deserve treatment. So I, I conclude with this statement from Elizabeth Clark, the twin condemnation of Pelagius and Origen writes one, well, it's Clark, ensured the supremacy of a Christian theology whose central concerns were human sinfulness, not human potentiality, divine determination, not human freedom and responsibility, God's mystery, not God's justice. What I find striking is that she doesn't point out and God's sovereignty, not his love. Uh, Christianity was perhaps poor for their suppression. 
In other words, I think what she's implying and the case that can be made is that what's really happened is that love has been cut loose from its early Christian theological moorings. So if I had a few more hours, uh, lots of other examples I could use, but I, I'll end my presentation there and I'm happy to field any questions or criticisms that you might have. Thank you. Carol. Thank you so much for, uh, for this overview, for these presentations. Um, we'll give our uh, audience a couple of minutes to weigh in with some questions. There are a few that have uh, come in already, but we'll, um, uh, I'll try to keep an eye both on our Facebook and our uh, Zoom channel here if anybody wants to answer uh, or ask any, any questions here. Um, one is uh, the, that we can just start with as we're waiting for others to come in. Um, tell more about what you like about uh, Diarmid McCullough's, I think is that, that's his name, Large One Volume, History of Christianity. Well, I think I, um, I appreciate the fact <clears throat> that he gives such a clear exposition as the Reformation, uh, this is actually Fiona's paraphrase of it, that the Reformation is just Augustine on crack. And that there is this kind of return to Augustine, but with a real vengeance. And, and he, he is honest enough to kind of portray the Reformation through that lens, which I think is demonstrably historically fully accurate. Um, and so, you know, I, I get pushback sometimes and it's hard. It seems to me that the only people who wanna handle Augustine with kid gloves are Latter-day Saints because we're, we're working so hard, right? To build bridges, to be compassionate and, and inclusive. And, and, and you know, I, I, I want to clarify that I'm not impugning Augustine's character or motives, but his legacy, I think is the greatest legacy of religious evil in the history of the world because of the perversities that he imputes to God. Um, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, an intel intellectual historian at Berkeley, refers to him as a, as a demented, twisted African demagogue. Um, I try to uh, avoid that kind of language. But um, for example, just, I just finished a, a, a great major biography by O'Donnell of, of Augustine. And in it, he, he points this out. He says, Augustine's contemporaries were distraught that Augustine could so cavalierly consign millions of infants to hell whereas Augustine seemed to be entirely unperturbed by that fact. And this is the guy who's the father of Christian orthodoxy and Protestantism alike. Uh, and yet all the research is there, it seems to me, to reconstitute a history that shows what our tradition could have been like divested of those innovations that he introduces. Uh, Daryl, I'll pick up a question as I do, maybe make it my own. Um, the question, I guess, goes to thinking of all of this from an LDS uh, restorationist mindset, um, where we have traditionally talked about a, a great apostasy that gives you an image of a sort of cohesive early church, which was lost, and then a restoration in the 19th century. Um, the picture you're portraying, maybe Augustine, is, is a point in time, come back to that. But the picture you're portraying is of many different threads, of, a, of uh, many different uh, ideas and concepts. And I, does that, do you think of that as playing back into a kind of traditional LDS picture of a, of a cohesive early church? Or? You know, that's, that's a really good question. It's one that I have to wrestle through. I'm not sure because on the one hand, it's simply historically irrefutable that there were a multiplicity of orthodoxies, right? In the early Christian centuries. Uh, every, that's universally acknowledged now. On the other hand, I'm trying to argue that there is at least a kind of coherent picture of an absolute love that, that, th that, that goes through all of these orthodoxies until we get 
to the, the, the fourth and, and, and fifth centuries. Um, what I find remarkable is that, you know, Truman Madsen was really prescient, was it back in the 60s when he wrote that essay called Are, Mor Are Christians Mormon? <laughs> And I tried to kind of update that with an article I wrote for First Things a few years ago, in which I pointed out that there is a widespread convergence on Latter-day Saint themes across the evangelical spectrum, especially, right? Try to find an evangelical today who will defend Augustine's theory of absolute predestination. Um, you, you, you can find some, but there aren't very many. Try to find anybody. I mean, even the Catholics, for heaven's sakes, are finding all different kinds of avenues to universalism, right? under Pope John Paul himself, as well as Balthazar and, and um, come on, I've forgotten the most famous uh, universalist now. Um, so it seems to me that we can retell the story with a little more sophistication, a little less animus, uh, not use the word apostasy. Uh, I will say this, that I presented this as a proposal to Oxford University Press, but initially my idea was to present it as a Latter-day Saint perspective on Christian history and oh, Terrific response, very receptive. Yeah, let's 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 see your manuscript. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I'm tired of Latter-day Saint studies being ghettoized. Uh, you know, there's kind of an implicit understanding in the academy that Mormons can play in their own, own corner of the sandbox, and we'll call it Mormon studies. But we're not really part of the larger conversation yet. And so I returned with a, an updated proposal and said, no, this is just a revisionist history of Christianity. And, and at that point, it was, well, we're not so sure now that we're, we're interested. And I said, fine, I'll go elsewhere. They go, no, 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 we want, we want first rights on this manuscript. So some doubt as to how it's going to be received if I'm not doing it from an explicitly LDS perspective. But my point is that the LDS perspective is in so many ways an increasingly universal perspective. If somebody, even like N.T. Wright on the one hand and David Bentley Hart on the other, are in perfect harmony with some of our core restoration ideas. Um, and since the late 19th century, nobody has defended God's impassibility, except C.S. Lewis. Um, so it, it just seems that we're, we're no longer the outline voice that we used to be. So. That, I, I know there are many questions, but that leads to one follow-up question, which is one way to think of the orthodoxy that you talk about is as a history of heresies, as a history of, of some central structure defining her heresies and they get thrown off to the side. Um, it seems to me that there are uh, lots of heresies. Um, what's to say, or are you saying that the ones you're picking out to follow forward in this revisionist history are um, are not, um, uh, what would you call it, um, confirmation bias, the things you want to see. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's why I think I, I try to articulate very clearly from the beginning that I'm not writing a normative history. This isn't a master narrative. It's a series of micro histories of specifically chosen um, mini narratives, so to speak. Um, and you know, I think in the post-structuralist age, nobody is safe trying to write a master narrative of, of anything, let alone Christianity. But I will say this, that over half a century ago, Walter Bauer wrote a very famous book, Orthodoxy and Heresy in Christianity. And his famous definition was, orthodoxy is just the heresy that won out. Now you have people like Alistair McGrath, who's generally a pretty accomplished scholar, but he writes an absolutely absurd book called Heresy, in which he says, oh, that's nonsense. There's been orthodoxy from the earliest Christian centuries. I, so my, my argument would be, don't even use those words. Why, why would we use words that are so ideologically fraught as heresy and orthodoxy? So I, I would just avoid those terms altogether and just talk about dominant strains and marginalized um, doctrines. Terrell, one other uh, question that a few of our people have asked, and I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it. Uh, why do you think... Um, Augustine was so popular and such a dominant uh, influence for so many centuries, if he was so wrong, if he was so yeah, uh, problematic yeah. for all the reasons that you lay out. What's your, what's your hypothesis there? Well, you know, Elaine Pagels wrote an entire book trying to answer that question. Um, I think it's a pretty interesting book, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent. And she frames it, right, ex explicitly like that. 
how on earth did this maniac ever gain hold over the Christian mind? Um, and she, she offers a couple of possibilities um, that maybe are, are psychologically plausible. One is that in view of the immensity of human suffering, right? Theodicy has never been satisfactorily resolved in Christianity. And she thinks it's psychologically easier to believe in a sovereign, impassable deity than one that is too weak to successfully pull off a benevolent plan. And so in a kindred way, you could say that we would rather be intimidated and frightened than perpetually perplexed. And at least there's, there's a way of making sense of human suffering if we have this view of retributive justice. Um, O'Donnell, in his analysis of Augustine, his explanation is, and he doesn't, I don't think he has any psychological supports for this, but he says, we just all identify with Augustine. We, we all are imbued with this kind of self-hatred and, um, you know, it's kind of the Nietzschean view, right? That this whole ascetic tradition represents this. We just can't stand the carnal self. And Augustine comes to terms with that in a way that we can identify with. Um, yeah, but it's certainly the case. I, it, there's no question that his views gained dominance through sheer political power. I mean, he was the consummate political operative and he was obsessed with destroying Pelagius. Uh, and he wrote, I, I, I forget, but something like 12 or 15 works just right in those years after the Pelagian controversy to absolutely efface his name from the planet. And once you've got the union of church and state, it becomes possible to enforce his orthodoxy in a way that was never possible before. I can summarize a, another round of, uh, of questions here, and I think it's maybe a point of further clarification, if you wouldn't mind weighing in on this a little bit, how your how the, the, the theory of early Christianity that you're putting forward here does intersect or does not intersect with um, traditional or revisionist accounts of the apostasy in the LDS tradition. Um, you and I were involved in the Standing Apart uh, book project from, from many years ago, of course, uh, which was an attempt to, to tackle this issue. Uh, and we're, I'm seeing in some of the comments here, some people are saying, oh, it looks like you're trying to move it back to the fifth century again. The apostasy started in the fifth century and others saying, seeing that you're sort of trying to distance yourself a little bit from that idea. This is a general question, but tell us a little bit how this project intersects with the LDS ideas of apostasy. Yeah, I'm certainly tracing the origins of what we call apostasy, uh, the most substantive origins to Augustine, to that era. The principal difference is that, is that the entire structure that I've outlined today is an absolute repudiation of conventional Mormon understanding of the apostasy as a definitive blight on, on, on the human mind and spirit. Because by tracing all of these ideas through to the 21st century, I'm showing the very opposite, that in fact, there's, there's been a, a perseverance of these threads in the Christian tradition, just always at the margins or underground. Um, and so in that way, I think it's a much more liberal and um, embracing and generous conception of Christian history than the LDS version, the conventional one. I don't know if Chris is uh, still still hel helping out with questions here. I'll, I'll dive in and pick out a couple more. Um, uh, some comments about uh, baptism of little children. Of course, we have some discussion of this in Moroni eight. Uh, uh, sort of how this shows up in the Book of Mormon. I guess we might we might uh, uh, ask um, if we take the Book of Mormon history. You know, it seems that these ideas were also uh, uh, sort of Augustinian view was also perhaps per per pervasive in the New World. Um, how, how do we make sense of some of those uh, some of those ideas? You mean, how do, you mean how do we make sense of some of them in the Book of Mormon or 
or just in general, what do we do with baptism for the dead and that I have baptism of children and it's, it's, it's history. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a question of how, how these ideas are showing up in, in the Book of Mormon. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, the Book of Mormon to me is just this perpetual conundrum. It just, it's like, it's so historically and thematically and narratively self-consistent it's like, it's gotta be a true history, but it took place on another planet. <laughs> um, no, I don't really believe that. I don't have a good explanation. I just am, uh, unlike um, our, our friend who did the, the Book of Mormon um, textual, uh, Skousen, I'm not a tight constructionist. I think it's clear that the Book of Mormon is filtered through a 19th century consciousness. I still think it's inspired and scriptural but either by divine intention or through Joseph Smith's subconscious 19th century themes infiltrate the Book of Mormon to some extent. Although, you know, it is, on the other hand, I mean, baptism for the dead, for children is a very, very old debate, right? Um, Calestius and Pelagius himself are not on the same page there. Um, the, the problem becomes in the era of Augustine, what is the rationale for baptizing little children. And if there's no original sin, it would seem that there's no need to baptize. And yet Pelagius insists that baptism is requisite for little children. So there seem to be hints maybe that they're understanding baptism maybe in a kind of adoptive way, as, as I think Latter-day Saints did in the 19th century, but we've lost that, that principally it was an ordinance of adoption. Uh, McCulloch in his Reformation history says that Luther had absolutely no rationale for defending the baptism of infants, but that was a bridge too far for him to attack that. Um, so I, I, it's certainly a debate that has been consistent. It wasn't unique to the 19th century. Terrell, that's, that's a kind of uh, lead into several questions that come up and I think are kind of natural questions. You talk, you're talking about a revisionist history that moves forward from early, um, early centuries, fourth, fifth century, and moves forward. Uh, there's a, there's a, a question that will, I think it will keep coming up. It's already appeared three or four times, looking backwards with the idea, is there, is there anything new or novel in Mormonism? Is, can we take everything that seems interesting? Um, you mentioned infant baptism or not infant baptism. Uh, as, as not being a, a new conversation at all. Um, concepts of spirit or soul of a, of, a, of a material nature is another one that's been mentioned. Um, is any of your work looking backwards or I suppose, and I know this, others have asked you this question, is it, looking backwards, is there anything you find that is new and novel? You know, I've never set out to look for novelties in Joseph Smith's thinking. So just my off the cuff response is the only thing I can think of would be the eternal family. And of course, even that we have precedents in Swedenborg, right? Very explicit, prolonged discussions of the eternity of the marriage bond. That bothers a lot of Latter-day Saints. Some people, right, uh, use words like plagiarism uh, to impute to Joseph Smith. I, I'm not troubled in the least because my model, my paradigm of Joseph's prophethood is inspired syncretism. That's how I understand his model for the restoration. The bringing of the church out of the wilderness, I think, is a synonym for inspired syncretism, and that's mostly what it was. Carol, we've got a couple of questions about universalism here, and um, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can summarize these. Um, what explains the opponents of universalism that appear in the Mormon tradition? And uh, how do you define the, the universalism that you see in the LDS context in relationship to other Christian universalisms? Right. Um, there was almost no pushback that I can find in the historical record to Mormon universalism until we get to Joseph Fielding Smith, um, and Bruce R. McConkie. Uh, they base their hostility almost entirely on section 76 verse 112. That, that where right, the celestial kingdom is, they cannot go worlds without end. 
that expression, worlds without end. And I think that's a heck of a lot of theology to hang on. One Hebraism, worlds without end, which I interpret the same way that eternal is interpreted in section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It means for a really long time or according to the nature of God. Um, so, you know, the historical record is quite clear. Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Brigham Young, Lorenzo, they all taught universalism by which I understand not everybody will be saved, but nobody will be denied uh, at any point. And uh, so I, I, I wish there were a better name than universalism. I would call it a, a, a no shut door belief. Um, and I, I think there's something in human nature that just revolts. I mean, why did the Lord tell that parable, right, about the laborers in the vineyard and the resentment that we have when somebody gets paid the same that I do, but I did more work, right? It seems to me that that parable is addressing universalism. We want to be rewarded according to our merit. And we know that legions in the church, well, maybe that's an exaggeration. Many, many people in the 1830s revolted against section 76 because it was too liberal. And Joseph Smith had to tell the missionaries, okay, stop teaching that in the British Isles. So, you know, we're elitists by nature. Wait, the questions pile up. The longer we go, the more questions there will uh -oh. be. <laughs> uh, but I, <laughs> um, summarizing a couple of them uh, is a question about corporeality, I guess, as something that is, um, important in a in a Mormon LDS concept of God, yeah. And uh, and I don't remember. I'm trying to remember your list of chapters, but I don't remember if that's on on the list or if that's something that has a another thread that could be talked about. Yeah, that definitely. I don't know if it was on my slide, but that definitely is on the list. I do think that Latter-day Saints greatly exaggerate the significance of corporeality. Um, that wasn't obvious to Joseph Smith in the first vision. That's nonsense. Um, he learned that God was passable in the first vision, not that he was corporeal. Um, I don't believe in a visionary experience. You can tell what the texture or materiality is of something you're, you're beholding. So I, I just never have found that an important idea. David Paulson, I believe, has done the most work from within the latter saint tradition, tracing the idea of the corporeality of God back to the first Christian centuries. Uh, and there were a number of voices who uh, defended corporeality. In the 20th century, a number of theologians, uh, a Frenchman, Sarreau, I think his name is, has argued that if we're going to impute passability to God, that implies corporeality. And, and he makes a complex argument to that extent. So it's certainly been revisited. There's a very famous study that just came out by a German scholar called God's Body, which traces the idea of corporeality in the ancient world, um, situating it more broadly than just Christianity, but he covers that as well. So it's an interesting theme, but I, I put it pretty down, low down on the scale of priorities. I don't think it's related to the theme of God's love. I could say that. Cal, I think you had a question uh, or two in there if you want. You're here, so you can just hop, hop on in. Oh, my goodness. I just had questions. You, you mentioned briefly about engaging sort of work of, the work of other Gnostic scholars in uh, this project. And I was just curious, um, other ways that you might see like this. I know that some people refer, um, some scholars, specifically April DeConnick, refers to Gnosticism as being almost this sort of like countercultural uh, sort of Christianity um, that exists. And I think, I believe one of the tenets that she's spoken about a little bit, a very small bit is, is universalism. I'm, I'm curious how you see, uh, how you see um, the work of the Gnostics play into this. Yeah, I'm going to just admit right up front, Calvin, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a lot to say on that subject. For one reason, it's hard to keep up with, with Gnostic scholarship. The paradigms keep shifting. David Brackey has just come out with a book in which he said, everybody's been getting it wrong. Um, <laughs> so all I know is that is that one has to at least make an effort to read Irenaeus especially against the background of the Gnostics because those are the foils that so many of the early Christians are speaking to or, or, or about. Other than that, I don't, I don't have a lot to say. Not, not an area of strength for me. Ask no, he can help you. <laughs> 
No, it's fascinating, especially that you say that because it is Gnostic scholarship is it moves so fast. I, I'm grateful and I think it'll be wonderful for a Latter-day Saint voice to step into the fray and I'm excited to watch your work. Yeah, thanks. One of, one of the lines of thought that is suggested by your work, Tara, but I, I think you're not doing this. So maybe it's somebody else's work is to take these ideas that you're drawing forward in this revisionist history and look at the way um, LDS Mormon doctrine and doctrinal conversations have moved from Joseph Smith to the present. It is, for example, a not uncommon to say that the early, um, the early church was more universalist than our, um, than the way we talk today in the 21st century. Yeah. I, you know, my perception is that the single greatest shift in the LDS kind of spiritual sensibility focus is that the 19th century was dominated by legalism to a degree that I really find distressing. Um, you know, when Joseph asked Oliver Cowdery to write the articles of the church, one of the articles, I wish I could quote it verbatim, but one of the articles was that we believe in the same pursuit of holiness that was characterized by the early Christians. And Joseph Smith just strikes that out and, 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 and gives us instead, you know, that man has to be called of God and ordained by those who have authority. Um, uh, Joseph sometimes took that to what seemed really extreme lengths, right? He said, you have to be clever about this and you get somebody in back of you. And if you know the right words and passage, you get into heaven and you'll trail everybody along with you that, you know, you can, you gotta be sneaky. Um, all, you know, if you read Voice of Warning, right? Which was the dominant Christian evangelistic text for a hundred for hundred years, from 1837 until Marvelous Work and a Wonder comes out. Whole focus is authority. Orson Pratt, whole focus is authority. And I mean, we still invoke that from time to time, but it certainly has no relevant or, or resonance, right? To today's young people. And so I tried to write a volume, right, feeding the flock which is my 400 page attempt to answer the question, does Mother Teresa really have to be baptized? <laughs> and, you know, I don't know that I, I came up with satisfactory answers, but at least I tried to. Um, and so I think it's very, it, it's a healthy thing. <laughs> if we talk less about authority and more about holiness and the imitation of Christ, but, you know, but authority has, has a place. Terrell, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here. And uh, we'll maybe, uh, Chris, if you want to peek through, if there's one other last question that we want to, um, that we want to make sure that we get to. But I want to e echo that point and maybe just get some, some further reflection on it, Terrell, because I think it's really interesting to think about the ways in which the, the the burning theological questions we might even put infant baptism, for instance, in the in the early uh, in the early 19th century are not necessarily the questions of the early 21st century. And this uh, issue of thinking about the, the iterations of, of, of the restoration and the kinds of ideas that are more important to us, perhaps universalism is the, you know, one of the driving questions that we have today. You, you, you would maybe put that in the top. What do you see as kind of the most relevant issues for the, the early 21st century in the LDS tradition uh, as speaking to the, the the questions of our time. Well, I, I I think I I would I would go back to the nature of love. I think that we I think that we can have more productive conversations about everything from racism to inclusion to LGBT if we focus our attention on on how do we understand love, because today I think it's been so banalized, right? that love for many people has just become synonymous with this, this, this kind of non-judgmental embrace, tolerance, condoning, right? And, and, and here's one of the most shocking things I've found in my research recently. This is, this is Rowan uh, Greer, who wrote a fantastic book called Broken Lights and Mended Lives. It's about early Christian thought. And he, and, and he paraphrases Augustine this way. Listen to this. He says, merely willing the other's good can scarcely be called love. And I, really? <laughs> How else are you gonna define love? I mean, for me, that's the only definition that works, willing the good of the other. 
complication becomes, how do we define the good? And that's where it seems to me theology has to play a role. How do we understand human thriving and how do we understand human purpose and potential in light of restoration theology? Then we can have a meaningful conversation about how we implement love in an appropriate way in the church. Let's close right there. That's, I like that. <laughs> Terrell, thank you so much for your generous uh, time, testimony, and sharing your talents with us uh, this evening. Our benediction will be offered by Catherine Shields, uh, a native of West Virginia and a curriculum developer at NW3C. Catherine. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful um, for the opportunity that we had to gather together and learn this evening and for the technology that made it possible for us to do so safely. We are grateful for the work of the scholars who are here and the scholars who came before us today. Um, and we ask that as we move forward this evening, we will continue to foster a sense of wonder and curiosity about the heavens and a love for our fellow man. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.